Why do we need protein and physical activity? This is the University of the Netherlands. Uh, I would like to start with asking everybody to get up. So just put your hands on your lap and then stand up. And then put them back on your front of your legs and then just sit out again. Now, at least some exercise while you're sitting, that's a good thing. But while you were standing up, you were using the, the muscles of your upper leg, and when you were sitting down, the muscles of the back of your legs. Now, you use these muscles on a daily basis, but you don't realize that they are actually broken down and built up again every day. That is a process that we call turnover. And your muscle tissue actually turns over at the rate of 1% to 2% per day. That means every day you break down 1% to 2% and you build up 1% to 2%. Meaning that in about 50 to 100 days, so two to three months, you have completely remodeled your skeletal muscle tissue. So you don't realize that in two to three months you are actually completely rebuilt. Now that's convenient because this muscle plasticity, that's what we call it, actually allows us to change our muscle, to become different. For example, with exercise. Now, if you look at these pictures behind me, it shows you that it can be completely different. If you start doing a lot of resistance-type exercise, you'll start to look like the guy on the right. And if you do a lot of endurance-type exercise, you'll start to look like the guy on the left. So we can modulate this. And of course, there's always somebody saying, the guy on the right was doing a lot more than just exercise and, and nutrition, but the guy on the left was doing the same thing. So I'll, I'll leave that out. The nice thing is that we can actually modulate this, and this is a good, good thing, because we can change our skeletal muscle tissue and the way we use it. But there's also a downward a drawback, because we can all easily lose muscle as well. In two to three months, you can lose a lot of muscle simply by reducing your physical activity. Who has ever broken an arm or a leg? You'll notice immediately after you get a cast, just after a short while, you, you notice that your muscle is actually going away. And after the cast is taken off, you see that's very rapid. So you can actually lose a lot of muscle as well. So what you need to remember from this is that muscle tissue and muscle maintenance is an active process. You have to stimulate muscle growth on a daily basis in order to maintain it. And for that, we need anabolic stimuli. Very simple, you've never thought about it, but you have them every day, hopefully. Food intake and physical activity. Now, to start off with food intake, when you ingest food, the protein in your diet will actually be digested up to amino acids, the building blocks of proteins. They are released into your circulation, transported to the blood, and then taken up by the muscle. And there they are being used as building blocks for your own protein, your muscle. The interesting thing is that these amino acids are not simply building blocks. They're also signaling molecules. As soon as the muscle sees these amino acids, it will actually start building muscle protein. So it's your food yourself that is stimulating muscle protein synthesis. Now, the nice thing is, how does this work? How can we actually investigate this? Now, what you can do, you buy amino acids with a small tag on it, some sort of a flag. We call them stable isotopes. Really expensive, and you can inject them in people. Then those labeled amino acids transport to the body, you can take small pieces of muscle with a hollow needle. It's not what we do in the lab. We actually get volunteers for that. We don't point at them, but you actually get them. <laughs> and we take the muscle out. We take the protein out. And then we see how much of those labeled amino acids are incorporated in the muscle. And that's how we measure muscle protein synthesis in vivo in experimental labs. Now, that gives you an insight on muscle protein synthesis. But it doesn't give you an insight on what happens all the way from food ingestion to muscle protein synthesis. For that, you need those amino acids in your food. Now, you can't purchase those, but you can make them. So what we started doing about 10 to 15 years ago, injecting those amino acids, not in humans, but in cows. And so the cows would actually produce milk and would integrate those labeled amino acids in the milk. So we could collect the milk and extract the protein and use that protein for human experiments. So we would provide subjects with that protein. They would ingest it. When it's digested, those amino acids would be released to the circulation with blood samples. We could actually see them. And then by taking muscle from the leg, we can actually see the incorporation of those labeled amino acids in the tissue. And in that way, you can actually measure what happens with the food. Now, and then you get uh, 
On the left, we see what happens when you inject amino acids. You can measure protein synthesis. It's very low if you're in the morning in an overnight fasted state. And you simply eat a single meal with about 20 grams of protein. You see protein synthesis, on the left slide, go up by about 40 to 50 percent. So simply eating does that. No consciousness there. And then it wears off throughout the meal, about five hours after the meal. Now, the funny thing is the right picture. That's being done with that intrinsically labeled protein from the cow we infused. What you see is that within two hours, the amino acids that were in the cow's milk are now actually your muscle. And a few hours later, you see that it increases further. So this is a very expensive and, and, and invasive way to basically show something very simple, that your mom is always right. You are what you eat. And in fact, you are what you just ate. Only two hours later, you can already see it as muscle. With these techniques, you can do all these interesting experiments to look at what is the effect of the amount of protein or what is the effect of digestibility. Now, digestibility is an important one. So if you actually take different types of protein, you will see that a protein that is very rapidly digestible has a greater muscle protein synthetic response. Now, these are two proteins that you generally hear a lot about in the media, and these are just two proteins out of milk. About 20% of milk protein is whey protein, and about 80% is casein. Now, casein is a very slowly digestible protein, and whey is a very rapidly digestible protein. And if you compare them, you see that whey protein, ingestion of whey protein, leads to a faster response, more amino acids released in the circulation, and a greater stimulation of muscle protein synthesis. And that is one of the reasons why you hear all those athletes talking about whey protein. Now, the differences are only small, and I think it's more like an academic discussion, but that is the reason why people talk about the whey proteins. But so, digestibility is an important factor. But also, the amino acid composition. What types of amino acids are in a protein? Now, you hear nowadays everything about plant-based proteins. I mean, everything has to be plant-based. But can you actually build muscle on plants? That's a question we get a lot. Now, plant-based proteins, such as soy or gluten, wheat, are actually proteins that are of a lesser quality. They have less essential amino acids, and actually, they are, tend to be deficient in specific amino acids. So if you give them to a, to a person and you compare it with an animal-based protein, the muscle protein synthetic response is generally less. But does that mean that it's not good? No, it just means you have to eat more of them to get the same effect. Or you actually are smart and combine different plant-based proteins, because then you lift up the deficiencies of all those individual proteins. So that is a reason why now a lot of people are looking at all these different proteins and how they would fit together to get high-quality protein. Now, of course, I only have a very small lecture, so I can talk about all the other effects. The digestion that we already had, the amount, but even how you chew, uh, how the, pr the protein is processed. All these, effect, all these things have an effect on muscle protein synthesis, and even the position in which you sit. So there's a lot of effects that drive the anabolic response to feeding. I already told you there's two anabolic stimuli. One is food, the other one is physical activity. So physical activity, exercise, muscle contraction, stimulates muscle protein synthesis, and does so for up to 48 hours after the exercise. Now, it becomes really interesting when you start comparing or combining food intake and physical activity. When you combine them, you see a greater response. Now, this is a slide where I'm going to explain first in yellow, in white, you see fasting in a fasted state, muscle protein synthesis, very low, and you eat a meal, a meal containing about 20 grams of protein. You see protein synthesis go up with peak levels about three hours after the start of your meal, and then it wears off again, waiting for the next meal. But now, if you're physically active before your meal, you'll see that your protein synthesis, in, in black or in dark purple, you see the protein synthesis goes up to a greater extent, and is also sustained over a more prolonged period of time. So, in other words, physical activity makes your muscle more sensitive to the anabolic properties of amino acids. So, with the same amount of food, you get a greater response, and you get more of the protein being used for muscle protein synthesis. So, I already told you, you are what you eat, or you are what you just ate. But if you're physically active, you're actually more of what you just ate. 
And that is a concept that is being used by all athletes and coaches because they generally consume some protein after an intense training session. And that makes sense. It doesn't have to be those protein shakes or protein bars. It could also be a normal meal. But ingesting some quality protein after a session will actually help you to repair and recondition the muscle. Of course, this is what we use for sports, but we are also facing a lot of muscle loss, and a lot of people are losing muscle. When we age, we lose muscle. When we become sick, we lose muscle. So, what is going on there? Now, if you give the same amount of protein to an older person and a younger person, you'll see that the younger person responds more with a greater muscle protein synthetic response than the older person. So the response seems to be blunted in the elderly. They now call this anabolic resistance. Great term, but what does it mean? What is the reason for this anabolic resistance? Now, there's still discussions on that, and you can, you can, you can blame digestion, you can blame perfusion, you can blame all these different aspects of the anabolic response to feeding. But when I already told you that exercise makes the muscle more sensitive to the anabolic properties of feeding, doesn't it make sense that less physical activity makes the muscle less sensitive. And so, is a great part of the anabolic resistance not simply an effect of less physical activity? Now, you can study that. So, what we do is we actually immobilize young guys, so, and girls. If you go to Maastricht, you see a lot of students with crutches and one leg in a plaster cast. And you think that's skiing accidents? No, it's not. They're our volunteers. And so, we immobilize them for one or two weeks, and then we actually do the same experiments that I showed you before. And then you see that the leg that was previously immobilized has a completely different response to feeding than the other leg. So it doesn't have anything to do with hormones, because it's the same person in the same body. The leg that was immobilized and had less physical activity cannot respond in the same way as the active leg. So, in other words, physical activity is an important component to the anabolic response to feeding. So, you are what you just ate. If you become physically active, you're more of what you just ate. But if you become physically inactive, you're less of what you just ate. Now, that concept is something that we have to use in healthcare, because we see that people lose about 1.5 kilograms of, of muscle within just one week of immobilization. Even despite the fact that the physical therapist grabs you and gets you back on your feet within uh, 24 hours of surgery, it's not enough. Less physical activity leads to rapid muscle loss, and we can treat that by physical activity and food intake. So, actually, we can go both ways. Now, I can start showing you all graphs of muscle turnover, and that when you're older, you can still gain a lot of muscle. But yeah, it's only science, it's only for nerds like me. I think I can give a better example. And that's why I'd like to introduce you to Ina Corlaas Revers. Can you tell me why you contacted me? Uh, you said that uh, all the oldies, my friends, they must eat a lot more protein and they have to move. They have to move and they have to do uh, power training. And I started power training six years uh, ago and it resulted in a uh, world championship 70 plus two times. <laughs> So she's the world champion powerlifting at 72. And this is just a weight that she does during her training. This is actually only half of her maximal performance. Really? And I think when she shows this, you might actually understand that uh, age is just a number. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. And just uh, that you don't think that these are inflatable, 
We would like to ask a volunteer just to just give it a little try. <laughs> <laughs> Does it work? <laughs> so just in, 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 in short, I mean, um, why do we need uh, physical activity and protein intake? I think the picture was made clear by Ina, and uh, thank you for listening. <laughs>